Rebellions are built on hope. All right, this is Tatooine Sons, the only fan podcast to name a canon Star Wars creature and to be endorsed by the writer and the director of The Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson. The best Star Wars movie. How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing hey. good. Doing good. <laughs> I'm here. So I was having a conversation today with the head of advertising for an independent studio. Okay. Um, studio, uh, an agency that works with a bunch of independent studios. And he's like, so I, I checked you guys, I checked you out before this Uh-oh. meeting. He says, my brother is a huge Star Wars fan. Okay. He says, he, he listens to Tatooine Sons. You got his, his, his uh, endorsement. Oh, wow. Before we have this meeting. I was like, that's, that's cool. pretty that's cool. Pretty, it is pretty cool. And then um, a Bronco, Denver Broncos uh, media insider, like goes to all the training camp stuff, does a daily podcast about the Broncos, all of that, mm-hmm. like in the locker room kind of guy for, okay. for the Broncos. He, uh, I was replying to one of his tweets today about the Broncos mm. and he's like, by the way, I listen to your guys' podcast all the time. It's really awesome. Oh, wow. That's so, crazy. It was a crazy day. That is kind of wild. It's kind of cool. We're going to change things up a little bit. <laughs> okay. We're Just gonna, a little bit. So uh, we've been, to, we've been doing a lot of, you know, kind of reaction to sh- movies, reaction to TV series. We, that's kind of the way this show has been from the yeah. beginning. We're going to, we're going to try something different. Okay. BB Nate's right. going to be excited about this. I one. am. So we're going to spend, we're going to do an eight episode series. Okay. Looking at everything surrounding DC Comics Kingdom Come series from 1996. Mm-hmm. So, it's a good series. It, it is a good series. I've actually read the whole thing, which is rare for well, me. It's only four so. issues. It's also yeah, 250 it's pages. It's, they're, they're, they're about 250 pages of comics. They're like they're big thick issues. issues because it was released in a format of Elseworlds, which yeah, usually which we'll had about. longer yeah, that's issues. What it was. So this week we're going to talk about the Genesis, which is uh, is that a re- is that convenient. a reference to the, might as well right? You know, there's a very biblical uh, storyline <laughs> in all all Revelation. Revelation, right? So we'll start with Genesis, and then uh, we'll do that after this little message from one of our friends over at the Christian Nerd HQ. This is Tatooine Sons. We are the Reverend and the Reprobate, just two best buds interviewing people we have no business talking to. I'm Lucas Pinkard. I'm Dan Gibson. These aren't tears on my face. Every Thursday, we interview somebody else from our favorite fandoms and yours. You can check those interviews out on the Christian Nerd HQ Network. You can find us on YouTube at RevRep Podcast at ReverendRep.com. And if you can't remember our name, just go to BaconOffice.com. It's way easier to find new episodes every Thursday. Thank you guys for supporting Christian Nerd HQ and check out the Reverend and the reprobate it's true all of it what is the name of the porg on the millennium falcon force is strong in my family what do you think his name is (laughs) it's a big moment i am a jedi like my father before me maybe turbis do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, <laughs> that porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys recorded an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was lit. I don't know why. Why did you think? Why do you think? I just kind of pictured him as being like an older, an older guy. Maybe it's because of his like his kind of older style. So how old do you think he is? Like Like really, like legitimately, he is. Like like currently, yeah. I would say forties or so. Well, that's just probably not even possible because he wrote this and he was already an established artist in 1996. So he's got to be in his fifties or beyond. So yeah, but I expected him to be. Older than you, that. Okay. So, right, so is but, that. But Jim Lee's so, not that old. He did comics in the nineties. That's true. That's true. So Jim, but Jim Lee is is uh, is not young either. No, he's not. So How old's Jim Lee now? He's about the same as Alex oh. Ross. <laughs> well, well, anyway. Anyway, welcome to Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of this generation. That there is a story. It is excuse me, written on our souls and that these myths speak to that story. And that is why we're beginning a new eight episode series this week on DC Comics Kingdom Come all the way, like I said, from 1996. Nice. So I was not alive. I was about negative five years old. 1996 uh, was the year I met your mother. 
Wow. That's wild. And let's, do a, let's just chaos. like pivot let's this in. It. Let's pivot this entire series and just do a How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> uh, Tatooine Sons edition. <laughs> edition of, of that. <laughs> Maybe not. So it only took y'all a year from when you met to get married. Oh, I, so. I told her I was marrying her on our second date. It's not we a very long seriously series. seriously turning into How I Met Your Mother. Was going we were engaged that. in four weeks. So... Um, <laughs> We a little little tip, our little little nugget of, of trivia. We were being we. I was asking your mother to marry us when the uh, Centennial Park uh, Olympic was. bombing was taking place. Wow, <laughs> wow, that's a weird. Piece it of literally trivia. was happening in the moment that that uh, I was asking your mother. It was explosive. <laughs> so um, yeah, oh, okay, anyway. all right, Sam. So uh, <laughs> Kingdom Yikes. Come. Yeah, you've yes. read it. Yikes. I have actually. But what are your? I think dr- I read it this year. What are your general so, thoughts on this series? It um, it well surpassed any like expectations or, or thoughts I had going into it. I just heard you know from Nathan that he loves the series, and I think Pastor Stewart said mm-hmm. that it's his favorite. And Lucas was talking to you about it just this week. Great, Lucas right, from right. Reverend and the Reprobate, right, Sam or Nate? Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yeah. and yeah, just everyone talked about how great it was and how it followed a pastor and not like superheroes. I'm like, oh, okay, it's interesting, but. The the complex story and the different look that we get at the characters and, and what a possible future could be, um, coupled with a biblical narrative that was executed really, really well. It wasn't over like over heavy handed or anything uh, made for a really like impactful story. Um, plus, I, I I don't think this is I, we probably mentioned this before, but Nate and I will both probably say that Alex Ross is our favorite comic artist. Really? He's inspired, inspired a lot of stuff. stuff. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a phenomenal artist. So we'll, we'll talk about him for sure. A whole so. series where he does not just the cover art, but the interior art too had an effect. I think that's cool. And you said this was in the last, within the last 12, 18 months you guys have. Uh, read yeah, it? it might have been this calendar year, mm-hmm. uh, 2023 that I read it. I, I don't remember it like, you know, too detailed um, for my reading. I it, think as we talk about I, it. Yeah, I definitely think it'll come back. Well, now, Nate, yeah, you just read why. it again today. I did. But all originally... pages? All, all of it. But you originally <laughs> read this like very early on in your comics very, experience. How old do you like, think you were when you originally read it? Maybe 13 or 14. Okay, so it was Which five, this is very, four or five years ago. Very heavy to read um, at that age. It's difficult to understand. It was even slightly difficult for me to understand now, but I was able to get it and understand it all, which was good. It's much better now that I've reread it. Um, but you liked it and before. Ama- I did like it before, but I like it even more now because I thought before, I'm like, this is just a really cool superhero story. I'm like, no, this is just an influential, really amazing, well-told story with art that surpasses some of what we have today oh, yeah. and has inspired generations of artists like Lee Bermejo and a bunch of their hyper-realistic artists that we have now. It's been amazing. Well, it's going to be fun to talk about it. Sam, what do you, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about what the plan for this episode or this series is um, with this going forward. What are what can listeners expect from a podcast series about Kingdom Come? What are some of the things that we'll discuss? Well, you know, we're, we're today we're talking about, um, you know, the, the certain themes and, and concepts that are discussed within the series and then and the history of and the, the history the origin and, and, and kind of the, the, the things surrounding the story. And then eventually we'll we'll kind of dive in a little bit more on uh, the specific narrative itself, talking about that, bringing down some of the characters and and uh, um, things like that, just kind of giving it each episode, kind of taking a more detailed look at, at something else in the series. And of course, um, with this series having a lot of biblical tie ins to it, um, you you know you you can expect us to to throw in our own uh, classic Tatooine sons yeah take. classic Tatooine sons look into uh, into this story so it's it's like the perfect uh, starting point for us for for this new yeah. uh, series yeah I think it's going to be fun to do this and now Nate you're the as everyone that listens to us normally knows um, you're the resident comic book super nerd mm-hmm. in the in this uh, in this group so what is the significance of Kingdom Come within the larger DC universe from your understanding it's difficult to explain because um, it doesn't have much influence into the larger DC continuity due to the fact that being an Elseworlds story so for those who don't know what that is explain Elseworlds is um explained as stories that could or could not have happened in the larger universe of DC on the infinite earths. There are midgen 
Legends and myths. Midgens. Midgens. That's what we're going to call that, legends and myths from this point that. forward. That we're going to say like midgens. It, uh, legends and myths like that um, have been told throughout the stories and that are from other Earths that we don't know if are true or not. Gotham by Gaslight is in the Elseworlds stories. So it's like what if in Marvel. Yes, it is. Way. It is what if in Marvel. I mean, we okay. have Superman speeding bullet, which was basically what if Superman landed in Gotham with the Waynes instead of in Kansas okay. with hmm. Kent's and, and the became, Elseworld storylines are going to continue in the DC Universe films yes uh, because they're going to create like Batman the Batman, the Batman series Joker Superman and Lois all of those are going to be That's Elseworld cool. stories very cool That's cool. Um, but as far as the significance on the DC world like in comics and things like that did it change anything in the way that stories were told in the DC Universe it, did it you know, help me understand. It helped us see more morally complex characters through that and didn't kind of let us see that the superheroes are not always right. And really showed that they can be human as well, because um, as we saw in the, the DC superpowered documentary, Mm -hmm. kind of the rise at that point was anti-heroes and Punisher and all of those type of characters, because they were, edgy and cool and didn't care and weren't told what to do by anybody and all this stuff and kind of was fitting into that 90s mindset of um what was kind of popular back then but this really showed that the superheroes that were at that point considered campy and cheesy and and while we had some things like the dark knight returns and killing joke and nightfall by that point it was still shown as um those are these superheroes but we want to see more of these anti-heroes these more down-to-earth grounded gritty characters in the gray area in the gray area and this showed that Every superhero has that gray area. Every superhero is morally complex and not cheesy and not campy. And there's a lot more to these characters that Mm. we didn't know. And so this really was able to show that if the story is told correctly, we really can see how these characters are well thought out and well created and can inspire stories that don't need to be edgy and gritty. They can still have that hopeful superhero tone to them which this definitely has that hopeful superhero tone but also the 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 gritty the um kind of the devastating side of what we see with superheroes this shows that a lot too Mm -hmm. it's well well balanced yeah it's interesting let's talk a little bit about the background um of this storyline and and you guys already mentioned alex ross which Mm -hmm. uh, is obviously an amazing artist um he's if you are listening to this and you don't know who alex ross is but you're a nerd culture person you know alex ross you just don't realize it his art is everywhere extremely influential his art for iron man oh i love it spider man everything he's done so much art for so many people Mm -hmm. absolutely Talk, talk a little bit about um who mark wade and alex ross are and kind of what led them to create Kingdom Come. Well, um, I'll let Nate kind of take the, the lead of this, but I did want to say something. And we were getting ready for this for this podcast, and I was kind of changing some clothes and stuff, and <clears throat> I was looking at my wall of comics, right, Iron Man comics, and um, I saw that one of the issues was written by Mark Wade as the all new, all different adventures. So I mm-hmm. thought that was that was kind of cool, you know, seeing yeah. that in preparation for today's podcast. But Nate, yeah. you're probably a little bit more familiar with his works, just a little bit. Um, when it comes to Mark <laughs> Wade, uh, haven't read much of his stuff. I'm currently reading his current series that he's doing for Superman, which first issue was fantastic. Which one uh, is that? Superman? Last Days of Lex Luthor. Oh, okay. Um, his, it was great, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But um, not super familiar with what Mark Wade has done. But I yeah, know I think that he did a lot of. The, he was kind of got he, cut his teeth on the Flash. He did, uh, and did he Superman, honestly some Marvel stuff. Um, That's what he did. He, one of his big things, one of his most influential writers for Daredevil. Um, it's mm. kind of Frank Miller than Mark Wade that really set well, Daredevil cool. into the set of who he is. Which I got to read both Frank Miller and Mark Wade's run, but. He really he also did Superman Birthright, which is going to be used as a starting point and kind of a comic that influences Superman legacy as well. So this guy is a big deal in the comics world. He's done a lot of stuff that has been super influential in the comics and not only including what I just mentioned, but he also did Kingdom Come and Kingdom Come it can be described in the same breath of influence on comics as Watchmen has. It has been super wow. important for comics. And they kind of patterned the way that this story was told after the Watchmen they comics. They did. Um, really? It was the morally complex superheroes hmm. and the um, kind of 
what is right and wrong with these superheroes these these gods what if they're left unchecked hmm. and have you what read happens then? i have not wow There's some stuff in there that i still have to kind of i'm not sure if i want to uh, read okay but it's also t- in time magazine's 100 greatest novels of all time it's wow. never gone out of print it's never gone out of print wow. it is the one of it is the most popular and most influential comic of all time right behind mouse as well so behind what mouse, mouse? which oh. won a pulitzer yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, I mean, comics are super important. People don't give enough credit to how important comics can, can be, be on mm. general literature. But yeah. this had no small shortage of influence. This also won a total of five Eisner's and Harvey's combined, which are book awards. Eisner's are specific awards for, for comics. comics. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they have that award ceremony every Comic-Con in yeah. San Diego. Really? And so... I mean, five awards for one series is huge. That's pretty insane. That is crazy. And it's basically unheard of by now. And it's only a four-issue series. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. so it really showed what comics can be. This comic helped put the medium of comics back on the map. It Hmm. was... Like, everybody looks at the 90s and the 80s as, like, this super important really popular age of comics because there were so many big issues that came out. You had the death of Superman and the reign of the Superman and you had killing joke and dark Knight returns and nightfall and, you know, man without fear and born again, daredevil and, and, and so many big series that came out back in the eighties and the nineties. It was 90s. also a, a, a tough time too for comics. Exactly. It was a really tough time compared to now. It was super tough. Marvel went bankrupt mm-hmm. in the nineties and DC was pretty much close to that point, too. It was a super important time, but nobody was buying comics. And Kingdom Come really put this back on the map as comics hmm. being important for the general public to realize. And then, of course, we had comic book movies starting to come up. But with comics, Kingdom Come was the hmm. main starting point. Well, I think it's also important to note, you know, you guys were talking about the dark, gritty mm-hmm. nature of comic books in the 90s. Um, and you know, I think that we've already talked about as we started talking about what the future of this podcast is going to be and how we're going to do more conversations like this around series. One of the things that we've, we've talked about was potentially sometime in the next 12 to 18 months doing a series on the dark Knight returns, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that on comics, the impact of that on Batman, the impact of that on films, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that very similar kind of concepts that we're going to talk about in this, uh, in this series. But but Wade and, and Ross actually wrote this in, in response to stories like The Dark right. Knight Returns mm-hmm. and the dark grittiness because they didn't like the direction exactly. that those comics were going. They didn't like The Punisher and Lobo and the way Wolverine had become mm-hmm. so really, really violent and The Dark Knight Returns and things like that. They right. were against, they wanted to see your superheroes need to be good guys. And that's exactly. what this whole story is really centered around mm-hmm. is you've got this retired set of classic superheroes from the Justice League that we all think about with with Superman and Wonder Woman and and Batman, of course, but the Flash and and um, Green Lantern and, mm-hmm. and these classic you know characters that have to come back and try to restore um, order order and honor to the idea mm-hmm. of being a superhero while there's this new breed of metahumans these, uh, that, are, mm-hmm. that don't care about the consequences of their actions at all, which was a, a mirror of what's going on um, with this. Hmm. Um, you know, w- talk a little bit about the uh, some of the other th- stories maybe that have influenced um Wade and and Miller, or excuse me, Wade Miller. I thought thought about Frank Miller for a second. <laughs> Wade and Ross, as they as they crafted this story and kind of um, uh, we're 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 going down the path of, of planning this out. Well, I mean, um, Mark Wade had already written quite a bit for DC, as we mentioned. You know, especially uh, he he cut his teeth on on the Flash. You know, and and. He, through working on that series, he gained uh, a kind of a reputation for very deep character work. You know, they they didn't just have you know the kind of Saturday morning cartoon, just flashy characters right. that were always his comics didn't really feel like ones you'd find in a gas station. They right. were more important. Than they that. had they they really looked at a character's um, personality and morals, which set him apart. Um, so using that, he he was able to create a nuanced and kind of 
uh, character driven level to Kingdom Come. It's not about having while it does have just about every DC superhero or character you <laughs> and want, and ones that you don't even hardly get mentioned, it, right? It's not a cameo fest. No. It's very focused on the characters and their motives and their thoughts um, behind everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, he really set himself up for success through his previous works on that. Definitely. And and with Alex Ross, uh, he worked on with Marvel a lot and he still works with Marvel a lot more than DC, I'd say at this point. But he worked on um, Marvel's, which was kind of a ground ba- breaking a series for its photorealistic, hyper-realistic artwork that was um, that is Alex Ross's signature at this point. You see a picture of Alex Ross art, you immediately know it's Alex mm-hmm. Ross. And every panel he does in a comic could be hung up in a museum. It's amazing artwork. And so he did that with Marvels, and it was super groundbreaking. And so he was brought on to this project and with Mark Wade and was writing this with him and wanted to have this artwork, this photorealistic, hyper-realistic, emotional artwork. As I was reading it again today, I noticed that you really do get to see the full emotions on each of the characters because there's more depth to them than just... You can connect to them a bit Just to artwork, yes. Like like at the end of the story when the, the pastor is kind of pleading to Superman to stop. I mean, there's just a couple panels of just focusing on Superman and you see a tear start to well mm. up. That's something you can't really like show as well without this hyper realistic photo mm. artwork that we have, and it was amazing. And I think another thing um, <laughs> about his style that lends to the story so well is he does a fantastic job of taking classic, what some people would consider cheesy looks of characters. Yeah, the, and the, making the them, classic golden age versions right, of these characters. And making them feel timeless, mm-hmm. like they're I- icons from you know, years ago, like any Greek God in a way, you know, and, and something about his style always kind of reminds me of kind of like depictions of like the forties and fifties, you know, that, that kind of art style that was prevalent. I don't remember what you would call it. Um, but just kind of that almost like grainy look Mm -hmm. to it kind of also helps set this story in a way that's almost like timeless. Like you could like, I didn't realize that this was written in the 90s when I was reading it. Mm. it you could have told me this came out two years ago and I would have believed right. it. You know, it really helps lend to that. Yeah. You know, we were talking about it a little bit as far as uh, Wade and, and um, Ross's inspiration for what this was. It was really Ross that came up with the idea while he was mm-hmm. working mm-hmm. the Marvels mm-hmm. um, series um, and how he wanted to do something like that in D.C. And again, it was in response to sort of this darker t- trend within comics and, and these anti-hero um, approach mm-hmm. towards uh, some of these characters. And he wanted to come back. So you see, he went with Wade and Wade was really, really passionate about let's get back to true heroes the in whole- Comics. style of heroes mm. and so yeah they work together um on this really well but there's also the um uh you know the biblical concept sam you brought that up a little bit earlier when we were we were starting on that talk a little bit about kind of some of the ideas in the narrative and how they weave the biblical narrative and the story into that right i mean well even just the name um of the comic is a a biblical reference um from, from one straight of, from the lord's prayer right, right yeah. from the lord's you know thy will be done um your kingdom your come kingdom your will come, be done will, yeah yeah sorry um you know it, it it's it's a reference and throughout the the story revelations is the book that's referenced but it's not like the story um, itself mirrors ev- uh, Revelation one for one. It it's told from the minister's um, mindset. I forget his name or his viewpoint, and he's having these prophetic visions of the future, and he's processing these visions through his his you know his worldview, what he knows, and that's the Bible and specifically Revelation because it's it's an apocalyptic literature, and what he's seeing are apocalyptic um, images and. So you'll see just certain scenes in uh, the comic that line up with something from Revelation. Not the whole story, but like when um, I can't remember a specific reference of one, but I know there's one re- referring to like Superman rising out of the you know the ashes and things like that. Like there there are parts where you're reading it and it kind of feels like everything comes to a head and you're like, Oh my gosh, the, the, this revelation, this, this prophecy has come true. So it's more of a, 
I'm trying to think of a word, a literary um, tool. Yeah, device. More than yeah. anything. Because biblical, you know, the Bible's been referenced in all sorts of things. It adds an almost weighty, epic, mythological feel to a lot of things when, when the Bible's referenced. And it works perfectly with this story following the myths and, and, and gods of um, DC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nate, earlier you and I were talking a little bit as you were kind of rereading this today about some of that biblical imagery mm-hmm. and, and some of the connections and ties. What are mm-hmm. what were some of the things that you noticed when you were reading it today? Like um, talking about Shazam and mm-hmm. the, the seven thunders and all that stuff at that voice, that lion's roar, that's, that's Shazam. That's the seven you know, gods is seven powers coming into hmm. that lightning strike and, and the Emerald city, which is talking about green lantern and the city that he created up above and the seven angels, which is the, the justice, the justice league, league that see. rises back. Up right. The, exactly. Hmm. And, and all of these things, each issue starts with a reference back to revelation to kind of as a starting point. And each, each issue almost except for the last one ends with reference back to revelation. It's a, big part of this story and it starts with the pastor talking about to his his friend that had these prophetic visions on his deathbed Mm -hmm. him talking about revelation to him and he yeah and and him preaching delivering a sermon um, exactly opening about revelation and then he starts having these visions and then specter comes to him to help him and and kind of bring him through as a as the witness of these events and which is such an interesting concept. It was so cool. It feels like a Christmas carol, but <laughs> a little bit, a, a lot, but it was such an interesting way to show this pastor and, and his hope and how it never wavered hmm. throughout any of this. And that showed hmm. his faith more than yeah. anything. It was so awesome. Even uh, the way that it ends with, uh, with Shazam um, and how the, the solution for the um, unwinnable scenario in mm-hmm. the story is not having the gods win mm-hmm. or humanity win. It's having the one person that bridges that. Gap. The one that's both the God man mm-hmm. with Billy mm-hmm. Bats and Shazam. The the one that is is all God and all man having to sacrifice himself mm-hmm. in order. Man, might, that might just be the dad moment be coming in, in the <laughs> middle here, but um, but sacrificing himself in order to save all of the earth um, with that is a really really powerful mm. uh, metaphor. Um, mm. and, and you know, Superman has very messianic, um, he definitely uh, is Christological mm-hmm. ideas within this. But I think that was a really interesting. Christological, yeah, that's a word. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, interesting. Any, yeah, um, I so, something today. Yeah, there we go. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, the way that they envision some of these uh, these classic DC characters um, with it. You you know, you've got your your main characters that you think about. We've we you know, Superman, Batman, and all of those. Talk a little oh, bit about some of the different I want to characters. Talk about one. I yeah, go for the it. Flash was super cool <laughs> yeah, in this story. Talk a little bit about well, that. Well, in a way, they kind of took each of these classic characters and brought them to their greatest potential. In a way, um, Superman was at his strongest. Wonder Woman, while I mean, okay, physically they're all at their at their strongest. Obviously, morally, they were a little. Uh, ambiguous. The, you know, they were a little messed up at this point because they were jaded. But physically, as superheroes, they were at their their greatest. You know, Flash. Well, he's he's constantly um, patrolling uh, Keystone City at all times, right? And he was like, every depiction of him, he was like phasing in and out of different realities and stuff. At one point, he's able to see mm-hmm. um, the Specter and, and and the pastor and, and the pulls pastor. him out of that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I just thought that was such a a cool depiction of the flash. They took that kind of kind of campy look with the hubcap and then made him like just an ethereal entity that you Mm -hmm. can't even like, Mm -hmm. like, uh, notice. I thought that was cool. Yeah, talk a little about some of the other characters. Yeah. I mean, go with Batman because Batman's yeah, a really Batman fun character. Is a good character in this. He, he Batman is the one character at, that really feels like he hasn't changed mm. morally. He is still Batman. He still believes in what he's doing, and will still be the cunning detective that he always is, and will double cross Lex Luthor at a drop of a hat because that's <laughs> that what he wanted great. to do, and that's what he found to be the best. And he he does patrol Gotham in a different way, and but people might be like, it's a police state. He's consistently, but he does it in such a way where he only acts if there is a crime, and then acts on that, but still doesn't compromise his morals and. Gotham is an insanely safe city now because Hmm. of what Batman has done, even though he's not out there himself. But 
it really shows that Batman hasn't compromised his morals, even with these new group of superheroes coming up. And with Superman. Now, okay, this I, too- before you move on, I have one question about Batman. It's not a serious question. It just it always bu- bugged me when I was reading it. When he's not in the full bat suit, he has and he's just kind of the, wear the ex, exosuit thing. Mm-hmm. The bottom half of his neck guard looks like Darth Vader's helmet. Like when he takes <laughs> off <Yeah>. the helmet <laughs> at, at the end of episode six, it looks just like that. I'm not crazy, mm-hmm. right? No, no, you're not. Okay. I just wanted to clear that up. You're good. <laughs> no, but um, Superman, it was super interesting to reread this because um, I've read the Injustice comics and played the Injustice yeah. game and everything. Oh. Yeah. And this follows a very similar story, but Superman took a different direction. Oh, yeah. In Injustice, Joker kills Lois Lane. Right. And in this, Joker kills Lois Lane. But in this, Joker is killed not by Superman, but And, and by, just so you know, if you haven't read this comic, that's like the opening. It's not like a, yeah. that big of a spoiler. No, that's, it, what's it deals the, with like, that what's, that's what starts the story. This is right. explained in like a backstory. Right, right. It's like yeah. Magog kills Joker. That's after. another biblical reference. Yes, is it, it is. You know, Literally so. in the name from Revelation. Which right. I loved. I, I watched a video kind of talking about how Alex Ross came up with the character design for that. And he's like, yeah, I just took all the parts about Rob Leefield's character designs so that I didn't like and combined it, which if you know Rob Leefield, he's definitely done some influential work, but he's also very infamous uh, as to some of his depictions. Oh, of okay. So right. I thought that was pretty funny. So what I really loved about this story was showing how the Boy Scout of Superman doesn't really change. Mm. And that's something that people were a little bit confused about and, and frustrated about. And it is something that frustrated me in Injustice, how much Superman lost it when Lois Lane died. Um, and in this one, Superman still keeps level head and retires after this because he doesn't want to be a part of the human world anymore. He wants to go to a digital farm and <laughs> live life the way he wants to live life a and, giant just, wow. and just forget about everything that happens in the real world and go into some solitude. And in Injustice, he goes the complete opposite direction. He becomes one of these young heroes that decides to enact vengeance and justice that he sees fit on the general public, which was super interesting. And I do wonder how Mark Wade and Alex Ross felt about that take on basically the, the injustice version, version. The injustice that version was after. of Superman because oh, it yeah. was way after. Mm. Um, but I really loved how Superman was shown in this story as still being this incorruptible Boy Scout hmm. because that's who Superman is. And that is also something that people haven't liked about Man of Steel and Zack Snyder's version of Superman because he he killed Zod and that's not what Superman's supposed to do. But he did it to save humanity. He did it to save humanity and that's when he became a human again. That's that's when Superman became the Man of Steel, not Kal-El. And that was a really great moment. And, And it happened in... Superman, Christopher Reeves version too. Zod died in that one, but nobody seems to care about. Well, that when you either. see the other version, there, there's an alternate version where he does, where they there's show that he survived. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So it depends on which version you think of, but still, it happened back then. Well, I think it's interesting. You know, when I think about this version of Superman, mm-hmm. this is the first chance, first time we see the grizzled, jaded, cynical, retired, removed from the story mm-hmm. old hero mm-hmm. this is the logan mm-hmm. yeah. story this is the indiana jones mm-hmm. in dial of destiny mm-hmm. who's moved this is luke skywalker in the yes. last jedi he acts Careful very now. much like luke skywalker in the last jedi in this yeah very I mean, he much goes so. off to seclude himself after things don't quite go how he expects i mean which I loved that because you know how much I love that. I think isn't this the first time we see Wonder Woman really brought into the storyline as like the Trinity in this? I mean, was she was she elevated to she that was level? Pretty popular in the '90s, but I don't know if she was elevated to this much of an influential character. In yeah, she was pretty important, story. but she was also kind of the most. Um, Morally ambiguous in this story. Yeah, she, she was, was pretty brutal and kind of lost it at some points. And she kind of she kind of transitions the through mm-hmm. the story from on 
Kal-El's side opening to kind of shifting over to the, the the other the other side of the Lex division Luther kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, like just get rid of these heroes kind of ideology, which is not what Superman wanted. It's not what Batman wanted. And that's why Superman and Batman eventually worked together at the end. But Wonder Woman kind of lost her way after this. And not the first time we've seen it. She's basically the same character in Injustice as she is in this. Really? Um, basically shot for shot. Uh, Wonder Woman starts to lose faith in humanity and tries to convince mm. Clark to be, join her and kind of rise up against these people. So that's very similar who she is in this story. But in this story, she still has a compass of morality and still wants to really do right by the world. But she's not sure how to anymore because she's lost so much in the 10 years that between you know where joker kills lois lane and kal-el goes to exile and and lost so much so it's interesting to see how that's factored Mm -hmm. into her character Mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about like the environment this is something you guys obviously weren't a part of but the world and the setting of this you know when i think of of the origin of star wars for example star wars is the product of a series of Movies in the 70s that were dark, they were gritty, they were angry, they were violent, and an environment, a world culture that was jaded and cynical and needed some type of hope. And that's very similar to the setting that that births this Kingdom Come Mm -hmm. graphic novel, both in the way comics are being told, being dark and gritty, but also the culture and the world at that time. I mean, you guys are, uh, you know, obviously unaware of that, but if, if it's dads and moms and old people like me, um, on here, listening to this, you know, the, the nineties, we're just coming out of the cold war. We're just kind of um, getting into this new world with lots of uh, globalization, lots of, uh, you know, the internet is starting to be born um, and take place. And it's, it's this, you know, we've got, we've got this, the racial tensions are, are, are coming back to the surface mm. with police uh, brutality, um, you know, coming for with like the Rodney King situation in South central LA and the riots that took place um, based on that. Um, and just a lot of disillusionment um, with, with the pub, with the, the public space, the, the uh, politics and, and fears in the future on that. And that bleeds into what, Wade and and Ross are telling in this story because there's this there is this you know is there is something to be hopeful for is mm-hmm. there is can good actually win um, is there any hope for humanity and for the future on that what are your thoughts on on some of that kind of stuff yeah and, and comics usually try to reflect the world that we're in today and, and then sometimes they are a way to escape from the the cruelty of the world but. This it was done in telling a way of hope and not really bringing bleeding in the real world into this. It was just there to show hope and kind of give people this outlet of escapism while still giving them a reason to kind of work on this. Yeah, and- I think it 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 captured the feeling the general public had very well without straight up, you know, bringing up real world topics. You know, it had that sense of unease and uncertainty, um, (laughs) but a possible hope for the future without actually, you know, quoting the Cold War or or anything like that. Right. Um, It it wasn't Dark Knight Returns, The Golden Child. (laughs) Explain. For those of us that don't know. That that was that it was the most recent sequel to Dark Knight Returns, which any sequel to Dark Knight Returns has been mediocre at best which is sad but this one was especially bad it was genuinely bringing in real world events with trump in the 2016 election Uh, and having that being the basis of the villain throughout the entire the the issue and i was like this is just you're bringing in too much of the real world for this to be an escape an escape yes for this to be 
it's too heavy handed. Yeah, I was going to say that. You're trying to get a message across and you can do it in a different way without it being so heavy handed. See, when that happens, it just takes me out of the story. Exactly. It took me out of the story. And it's one of my least favorite comments. Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of when we dealt, when we talked about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and when they were dealing with some real world issues, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, Mm -hmm. the experimentation on African American soldiers during World War II and post World War II and racism and globalization and immigrant issues. And, and refugee issues and all of these different types of things. But they did it in a way that it allowed us to experience that world and those issues without having to hear it being preached, which opens up an opportunity to have a conversation exactly. about it, which is, I think, what, what you what say you like should, about this story. It's versus what I love about the story. It's what I love about most stories that tell these kind of versions of real world events it that's really how it should be done it, it allows you to think more about it after the fact not to have it kind of thrown up on you while you're reading it and it's more important to kind of have that set with you rather than you just being like okay well this is just i feel like i'm reading a newspaper with illustrations rather than a comic book that is supposed to have superheroes and and really big moments to it. It didn't feel like that. And this is what this did. This had the big moments. This had the ability for you to think on it afterwards. As we're doing now, we're taking eight episodes of a podcast to talk about everything that this series did. A comic book series that came out almost 30 years ago. Exactly. That's crazy. You couldn't do that with some of the stuff that like, like you couldn't do that with The Dark Knight Returns, Golden mm-hmm. Child. There's no feasible way you could have eight episodes talking about that. And while it is shorter, there's just nothing you could pull out of that that mm-hmm. you couldn't fit into one episode. But there is so much hidden in this series that's important. Yeah, and I think one thing that is, is not really, it's, it's not hidden at all. It's sort of front and center. It's a, it's a primary element of this, is this divide between the classic generation of superheroes and this new generation. Mm-hmm. Which follows today pretty well. Well, it follows every generation yeah, right i mean that's that's like the, the issue and i think it's important for us to, and we'll look at this in an episode later um we're going to go into detail on it but um it's going to take up an entire episode i mean it's this is a multi-generational uh a podcast mm-hmm. so it should um do that but talk a little bit about maybe the new heroes um and that generational conflict in this yeah there was a lot to it and it was really interesting to see because the new heroes, which we see today, even in comics, new heroes are more violent, less reserved, less um, morally right in a lot of things. I mean, you can you look at one character for that as reference. You look at Damian Wayne and his mm-hmm. ideology against of uh, what what should be done against these supervillains. And he started to become more like Batman, but he's young. Now, he's, isn't that though more the result of his his training and his, his upbringing? upbringing and everything? Okay. But still he has this ideology that heroes need to be different. And a lot of that happens in this story. Heroes believe that they need to be different. They need to enact a instant judgment on these villains. See, one thing I, now, I don't have as much exposure or experience with this character as you might, Nate. But one thing, at least in, in the Gotham Knights game, um, that I like about Red Hood is he kind of comes from that mindset of Damian Wayne where mm-hmm. judgment needs, you know, he, he was totally fine with killing. Like, judgment needed to be enacted to, to begin with. And then when he was readopted into the Bat family, he struggled with adopting... Um, Bruce Wayne's mentality to justice and it took him a while to adjust to that but eventually he learned why that was the way things needed to happen and he he kind of he went backwards he learned the mm-hmm. true form of justice that these old heroes in like in, in Kingdom Come were trying to enact that the new generation can uh, quite understand he kind of bridges that gap in a way um, which is something I find really interesting about that character am mm-hmm. I kind of on the right track yeah you are yeah. okay I think another thing that's really fascinating to me is the positive portrayal of Norman McKay Mm. as a religious leader, as a pastor, not a religious denominational leader, not like he's not a a pope. He's not a a a televangelist. He's He's not. Yeah, he's not a famous pastor or anything like that. He's a small town, little church like the like. In the first panel, we see him preaching, and there's maybe 30 people in his congregation. Mm-hmm. But he st- and he talks to Specter. He's like, "I can't go. My congregation still needs me." That's 30 people. I love 
yeah, how they portrayed it. He's yeah. not a zealot. He's not a uh, an. He's a shepherd. Cultist. He is a priest. He, he's, he's, he's a, a pastor. He's a pastor. And that's all he wants to do is just yeah. be there for the congregation. No matter. And mentor them and minister to them. That's it. But he's the one that truly saved the world. Saves saved the, the world. day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is this religious the small everyday church, guy. everyday pastor that's just trying to care for his own flock, his own people, trying to to maintain hope in a world that has become more and more hopeless, trying to pass on hope to people who desperately need it. He's the one that ends up at the end of this persuading mm-hmm. Superman at the very human. end to be human again. And I think that. you can respect that character and, and that regardless of your religious stance or affiliation, I, he's, he's just such a down to earth everyday person and it makes for a really interesting story that way. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk a so little good. Um, kind of as we begin to wrap up here uh, in this episode, what, what was the initial based on what you guys understand? What was the initial reaction um, both critically and by fans to um, the release of Kingdom Come. Mm. It was positive, <laughs> immensely positive because it was something it was something new. And and while it doesn't seem like it would be something new, we're taking characters that are old. We're taking characters that at that point were campy and and just giving the the hopeful superhero story again. People understood that when it comes to comic books, we truly need that. And this was the first time in a while we had that hopeful story told in such a beautiful and amazing way that people just you you couldn't miss it. If you were alive in 1996 and you followed comics, you could not miss the Kingdom Come miniseries. Mm. It wasn't something you could do. And so it was shown by critics and by fans and by comic stores running out of these issues and having to have multiple printings of these issues that this series was important and everyone just thought it was amazing. I have not met someone that has read this series that says that it's okay. (laughs) Everyone's like, this is an amazing series and absolutely was influential on the comics we have today. Yeah, I mean, it's not the... The serialized comics that that are are prevalent. While there's nothing wrong with those in any way, in fact, I've started kind of getting into them a little bit. They're great fun, and they can have interesting stories. Something about a a story where they give a small team of creators complete liberty to tell the story that they feel needs to be told, not that they would necessarily want to tell. I mean, they did want to tell it, but something that they felt was important to tell with their own freedom to tell allows them the 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 room to tell an influential story. You're not bogged down with ties to the canon or having to right. fit into short, you know, 30 page issues or anything. Yeah. It allowed them to tell the story that resonated with fans mm-hmm. at the time because it was also such a standout story amongst all of the grim dark yeah. stories that were prevalent and at the time. And it really shows against the people you know that people are like, oh I hate the multiverse it's ruined comics. If we didn't have the multiverse, we wouldn't have had this story. Right. We wouldn't have Elseworlds. We would not have Kingdom Come. We wouldn't have Watchmen. These things would not exist without the creation of the multiversal introduction Concept. into comics with the flash with the 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 flash of two worlds that insanely classic comic mm-hmm. cover mm. that was the beginning of these stories the ability to tell these stories crisis on infinite earths was told from a multiverse perspective the multiverse isn't bad if it's used correctly and not in doctor strange in the multiverse ah, madness. you're gonna throw that dig in every opportunity to, every you time have. every time you know, you, you talk about the impact of that, mm-hmm. two, that, that the flash, what was the name of that one you re- mentioned? The flash, uh, of flash of two worlds. two worlds. The flash of two worlds had on creating the multiverse and how it Absolutely changed things everything, yeah. um, with that, which then allows for kingdom come um, and stories like it to take place. But what are some of the things that kingdom come brought to the table that have had a lasting impact on the DC universe? And we kind of talked about this at the beginning, but specifically what are some of those things? Yeah, it really helped um, show that there can be deep, stories of these superheroes that we love and that these superheroes that we love we can connect with them more if we show that they have human emotion you can connect with these characters more if we see them beaten if we see them have a fit of rage if we see them 
morally broken at these points, we can connect with them more. And that's allowed us to have these amazing storylines that we've had today with a lot of comics now, with with Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil run and with Chip Zdarsky's Batman run and, <laughs> and with so many comics, like even the I Am Iron Man series that you've been reading, Sam, each yeah. issue itself tells a story of how Iron Man can be broken and how he comes back from that, mm. at least from what I've read of it. And so every comic now shows that these characters are are pretty much us and that's what makes them heroes instead of them being these insane superheroes that we can never these god these these people we yeah. could never relate to we now can relate to and this series really helped say that also helped with making sure that comics don't need to have so so art <laughs> they really can have beautiful art to it and still be on time <laughs> yeah absolutely what about yeah you? i'm not sure there's really much i can add to that nathan really summed up everything i would i would think about that series so um you know as we get ready to move forward into other episodes regarding this and we start talking about characters and we talk about the artists and we talk about the impact and we talk about those types of things i think that one of the things that i'm walking away from this initial conversation with is that in the midst of a crazy, challenging world environment um, that's being illustrated through, because you know, art illustrates life, right? Um, with that, art imitates life. Art imitates life, right? So Same these comic, <laughs> these comics, these comics that were coming out in the '90s were dark, cynical, gritty anti-hero stories that were looking for justice and. It, regardless of how you got it, mm-hmm. which was reflecting what so many people were feeling at that time. We're in that same time right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We feel so many people feel that way um, in our world um, today. And, you know, I think it kind of connects to a, something I want to share as a dad moment. I am your father. Hope isn't found in vengeance. And I think that that's what you see the battle of this mm-hmm. story taking I mean, place. That's the plot of the Batman movie. Right. <sighs> That movie's good, <laughs> but that's the that's the idea, right? So, so you've got you've got this world that's looking for justice, and they see that mistaken, or mistakenly see this as being vengeance and and destruction. And I mean, we're locking up superheroes in a mega prison in this because we can't control them. But then at the same time, they're battling it out, and collateral damage is happening everywhere, and these heroes don't care, and and there is no hope, and so Superman comes in and tries to, to, to impose you know, order on the situation with the Justice League all over again, and that doesn't work. And the answer isn't any of those things. The answer in this is a simple man, a human, a pastor, who brings hope and, and, and brings a message of hope even to somebody that should probably not listen to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's how we move forward in our lives and in our world, right? If you can bring hope to the people in your circle of influence, whether Mm -hmm. or not that's a Superman in this comic book where finally he gets Mm -hmm. a chance to speak to him and and he brings a message of hope to him or and and humanity Mm -hmm. right uh, to him. Or if it's a pastor and his little congregation of 30 people and he's sharing that message of hope, whatever your world and your circle is, just be the type of person when someone spends 10 minutes or two hours with or is around all the time they walk away and they feel hopeful because they've been around you i think that's probably the message that wade and ross were trying to get back get past with this Mm. was that we need to be people of hope yes um and i think that that's what we're going to see throughout the rest of this so i'm very excited uh to see where this goes yeah um with this what are some of the takeaways that you guys had from our conversation the exploration and uh, of the the origins of this oh i mean (laughs) it, it feels like I want something like this to come out nowadays, but in other ways we don't need something to come out nowadays because this story can still apply even now um, in this, in this crazy world, like you were mentioning. So I'm excited to, to take a deeper dive into that. Mm. It just reminds me that comics are really good. <laughs> we can have really great <laughs> comics that really speak to people if they're done right. And yeah, this one really did a great job with that. 
I do think it's interesting, though, that when you talk about how we don't need these stories told again. We mm-hmm. so do. Well, I'm not, I'm saying like we don't need. Because this one exists. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that Wade and Ross say that you couldn't write this story today. They've said recently in interviews. Yeah. They're like, no, we couldn't. No, not for me. It would. No one would allow it to be written. But like, no, that we. it would have to be a different story with different characters and different concepts because they don't think that it translates into today. But from a next generation perspective, you guys both feel like it translates perfectly into today. Exactly. It, it's a timeless comic. It really is, in my opinion. I think that's pretty amazing. What are we going to talk about the next time? Well, I think we're uh, we're going to talk about the narrative, you know, uh, we're going to dive deep into the plot of the story. You know, we're kind of taking a surface level 30,000 foot view here. Um, we're going to talk about its complexities and, and it's kind of its progression and the way it navigates through the various DC characters arcs. There's a lot of characters it's got to, to, oh to weave gosh, through like some of the while still mount, focusing. biggest amount of characters in a yeah. DC comic I've seen. Um, and it will, it'll also be a bit of an analysis on like the storytelling methods that they utilize. You know, and, like we were med- and of course, with Revelation. Planet Krypton. We can't forget. We cannot Krypton. skip. I really Planet want a Planet Krypton, Krypton play. Like, green Arrow, Green Lantern. I, who am I? Who am I? Again? Um, I really want a Planet Krypton in the real world. I would go to that in a heartbeat. That's awesome. Um, well, that's it. That's going to do it for an episode. It was a longer episode, but you know, it was fun. It well, was a good conversation. Kingdom Come <laughs> deserves a lot of conversation. Yeah. And, uh, and we're going to spend another seven about. episodes doing this. For 30 so. years has been talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Almost 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, how can listeners uh, share their thoughts and feedback on this episode? What are some ways they can get in touch with us? You can um, you can leave us reviews for one on Google and Spotify or Apple Podcasts, all those little things. But you can also, um, you know, message us or, and, or whatever on our social medias. Like they can X us on uh, X. I don't like that. On, Twitter on Twitter. It's Twitter. You could t- follow Feel us free on to express yourself. Okay, that was pretty good. Yeah. That one was good. You need to, you need to hit up uh, Elon. I told Elon like, that. I he didn't idea. listen. So. Oh. Um, we're on Facebook as well. That's still Facebook. It's always been Facebook, believe it or not. No, it's no, meta. No, it's meta. It's meta now. No, it's, the app is still Facebook <laughs> until they, they do the weird loop. And we, you, can, you can find us on threads. I'll see the notification <laughs> and respond. Um, same that it's always at Tatooine Sons. Yeah. And F- SONS. SONS. SONS um, with that. And I think that's going to... Uh, oh, make sure you check out the CNHQ, the Christian yeah, Nerd HQ. Yeah. Um, with all the see different uh, shows on that. Uh, Mondays is uh, Christian Nerds Unite. We're Tuesdays. Um, Wednesdays are fangirling over Jesus. Thursdays are the Reverend and the Reprobate, and Fridays are speaking dirty. Mm-hmm. Um, check out all the shows. The links are in, yeah. the, in the notes below. Mm-hmm. I'd love for you to check those out and share this with people. Make sure if you've got DC fans or comic book fans in your life that they get this, they get in on this series. We'd love to uh, allow uh, them to to hear this show and and engage and with us over a long read haul. Kingdom Come, then and if you them. haven't read Kingdom Come, go buy it. Please, please do buy it. It's worth it. Yeah. It's everywhere. You can find it basically anywhere. You can probably find it at Barnes and Noble. You definitely could find it. Books at a million. Noble. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Amazon, anywhere you want to read it, it's yeah. there. Absolutely. Well, I think that's going to do it for this week. Anything else you guys want to say? May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you always. This party's over. I like that monkey. Don't get technical with me. Joy, please.